Welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the third isomorphism theorem. Now, we're going to begin with a discussion of the correspondence theorem. Okay, now the correspondence theorem, some people will view it as being part of the third isomorphism theorem, whilst other people view it as being separate from the third isomorphism theorem, and something that you need to understand in order to understand the third isomorphism theorem. We'll sort of go halfway in between. We'll view the correspondence theorem as a separate named theorem, but we'll sort of view it as part of the third isomorphism theorem. That's the sort of general picture that people have, okay, because you cannot understand the third isomorphism theorem without understanding the correspondence theorem, okay, and they're very much so interrelated. Okay, so we'll start off then uh, with a discussion of the correspondence theorem, and in fact most of this video is going to be dedicated to understanding the correspondence theorem. The third isomorphism theorem, what people usually actually call the third isomorphism theorem, will just be a little statement at the end which we'll prove. Okay, so uh, we will discuss then the correspondence theorem. Now the correspondence theorem is all about quotient groups. It's all about a special incredible bijective correspondence between the subgroups of the initial group that you're going to quotient out by that contain the normal subgroup, okay, that you're going to quotient out by, um, and subgroups of the quotient group. So let me explain this. So we'll start off just with a brief recap of quotient groups because being familiar and having the concepts of quotient groups in our head is going to be utterly essential to understand this theorem. Okay, so let's say that we have some group, capital G, and it doesn't need to be a finite group, it doesn't need to be an abelian group, it can be any group, capital G, and we've got some normal subgroup of that group, so we'll call the normal subgroup uh, capital N here. Okay, so it is a normal subgroup of capital G. Okay, and I'll denote everything to do with N in orange here, and I'll denote everything to do with the entire group in green here. Okay, so let me just draw a picture then for this. So we'll have our entire group represented by this box. So this box is representing all of the symbols that are in our group. Okay, the set of all the elements of the group, like so. So I'll colour it in in green because we're pertaining anything to do with the group in green. And then we'll have the normal subgroup here. So let's say the normal subgroup is down here. Uh, and I'll colour that in in orange here. So. In fact, I'll just outline it in orange rather than actually colouring it in in orange. So there is the normal subgroup. And I'll just label up G as well. So the entire thing in green here is G. Okay, so what we can then, of course, do is we can quotient our group out by the normal subgroup. So we can construct now the quotient group of G quotiented out by this normal subgroup. And I will denote everything to do with the quotient group in yellow here. Okay, it's going to help to have this colour coding uh, when we actually come on to uh, discuss the correspondence theorem. Okay, so, of course, what do we do when we quotient out the group capital G by the normal subgroup? Well, we partition the group capital G up into the cosets of the normal subgroup. Now, I want to make this look good, so I'll uh, firstly halve it and then split these into thirds. Okay, so that looks convincing. Here, I've got the six cosets of the normal subgroup here. Of course, more generally, that's just a picture. More generally, you could end up with a huge, great variety of number of cosets here. Uh, but for the picture, I've got six cosets of the uh, normal subgroup here. And we know that no matter what this group is, whether it's abelian or not, uh, because we're dealing with a normal subgroup here, when we actually partition the group up into the cosets of this normal subgroup, we get one well-defined partition, okay? If you construct the partition of left cosets, or the partition of right cosets, they are exactly the same, even though we're not necessarily working with an abelian group. Okay, that's the miracle of normal subgroups, that uh, the left coset partition and the right coset partition converge, they are equal to one another, there is only one way to partition this group up into the cosets of this normal subgroup. Okay, so this is the one and only one way of partitioning the group up into these cosets of the normal subgroup. Okay, so we partition the group up into these cosets, and then the elements of our quotient group become the actual cosets. Okay, so the cosets become the elements of this set, and they're the things which we are going to define the composition law on. Okay, so the first thing we'll want to do is name up all the cosets. So, of course, uh, the 
actual normal subgroup, this is a coset of itself, okay, and this is the coset that contains the identity element of the original group, so this is the identity in the original group, capital G, okay, so because this is a subgroup, it has to contain the identity element, and the way that we name cosets is we take a representative from each coset and then put a bar over it, so we pick sensible representatives, so for in, in this case, we will use the identity because that's the most logical one to use, you could use any one, I mean, it's just notation, but you would like to use the most sensible one, and the identity is screaming out as the most sensible one here. Okay, so we will call this coset, this entire subset of the group capital G, the entire normal subgroup, which is a coset now, um, the identity bar, which means the coset that contains the identity from the original group. Okay, uh, more generally, if I've got a coset here that contains a representative A, I will call that A bar, and as I say, uh, you could use any representative you like. Uh, the notation is ambiguous, but just pick a representative, put a bar over it, and that will be the name of your coset. And obviously, each coset only gets one name. You don't give it multiple names, okay? Right, so then what you do is you put these cosets into this set. So this is a set will look like this. You'll have the identity bar, the coset that contains the identity, you'll have a bar, etc. So the elements of this set become all of these cosets. And then to actually turn this into a group, of course, what you now need to do is define a composition law on these cosets. Okay, at the moment it's just an interesting set that we've constructed in this bizarre way. We now want to turn it into a group by defining a composition law on it. Now how do we define composition? Let's say we've got a coset a bar and we want to compose it with another coset, B bar, and the composition now is in this quotient group, so I'll colour it in in yellow there. How do we define composition of two cosets in a quotient group? Well, the way you do it is you say, take a representative from this coset, take a representative from this coset, you might as well take A and B, compose them together in the initial group, so I'll colour that composition symbol there in in green because it's pertaining to the original group, you'll get some answer in the group capital G, and that will have to be in one of these cosets. So drawing a picture here, let's say this is the coset B bar, you'll compose A and B together, maybe you'll get A composed with B, and it's up here in this coset, what are you going to call that coset? Of course you can call it A composed with B bar. Okay, and that composition is in the group, capital G. So you take representatives from these two cosets, compose them together in the initial group, and take the coset that contains the answer. That's your answer in the quotient group to what these two cosets composed together are equal to. And one of the things that we prove in the video of, on quotient groups, which obviously I'm not going to prove here because this is just a recap, is that this is well defined, i.e. whatever two representatives you pick, pick whichever representative you like here, pick whichever representative you, you like here, you will end up with a different representative of this coset when you actually compose them together, but you will still end up with the same coset. Okay, so if you gave this job of composing these two cosets together to two different people, they will come back with the same answer, even though they might have used different representatives from the two cosets to actually compose together to get the answer. Okay, so it's well defined. In addition, uh, it actually obeys the axioms of a group because uh, the original group which obviously this is incredibly related to, obeys the axioms of a group. Okay, again, I'm not going to prove that here, uh, but if you are um, woolly on that, uh, then um, watch the video on quotient groups where we do go into all of that proof. Okay, so there's my recap of how quotient groups are constructed. Let's now actually uh, see what the correspondence theorem is. So the correspondence theorem tells us about what the subgroups of this quotient group are. It tells us about the subgroup structure of a quotient group, okay? And this is the theorem. So the theorem is that there is a bijective correspondence between all subgroups of the initial group, capital G, which contain the normal subgroups. So let me start by writing this down. Okay, so we are now interested in subgroups H, which contain the normal subgroup. Okay, so the normal subgroup is going to be a subgroup of this subgroup H, which itself is a subgroup of G here. Okay, so I hope you understand what I'm saying. We're now finding another subgroup of G, okay, which is in between these two, and of course N will be a normal subgroup inside of that, because if N was normal inside of G, it's certainly going to be normal inside a subgroup of G that contains it. Okay, so that's absolutely fine. 
Uh, so n is going to be normal inside this subgroup H, which is a subgroup of G. So marking this on, what do I mean in terms of this picture? Well, I'm looking at a subgroup of G that contains n. So maybe I might be looking at something like this in pink. Okay, it's going to be a subset of G, which completely contains n, and it needs to be a subgroup of G. Okay, and we'll discuss that more in detail, because at the moment you might be wondering, well, what right do you have to say that it's going to contain cosets perfectly like that? Why couldn't it just be a sort of random blob that contains n? Why is it so ordered in this way? But you will understand that. We'll discuss that more in a moment. Okay, but the picture uh, that I've drawn here is right, basically. It is going to contain an exact number of cosets of n, and we'll discuss exactly why that is in a moment. Okay, so you found some subgroup of G that completely contains n here. Okay, and it's not necessarily proper containment. It could be that you pick H to actually be the same as N. Okay, it's still the theorem is still going to work there, and we'll see exactly why in a moment. Okay, so now the correspondence theorem says that this subgroup of G that contains the normal subgroup capital N corresponds. It has a corresponding subgroup in the quotient group. So here we go. I can use this to find you a subgroup which I'll call H bar, so I'll stick with using the bar notation for everything to do with the quotient group here, which is going to be a subgroup of the quotient group G quotiented out by N. So I can find you a corresponding subgroup of uh, the actual quotient group here, G quotiented out by N. Okay, so uh, let me just underline this in yellow here. Okay, so from having a subgroup of G that completely contains the normal subgroup, I claim that you can find a very natural corresponding subgroup of the uh, quotient group G quotient out by N. Now let me make this explicit. How do you actually find this corresponding subgroup? Well, H here, look at the picture. H is a subgroup of G. That means that if you were to imagine getting rid of the outer portion of G, imagine getting rid of all of this, the portion that's outside of G, H is a perfectly valid group in its own right. Okay, it exists as a group in its own right. It doesn't rely on G to exist. You can get rid of the rest of G. And this is a group in its own right. It's a set of symbols with a composition law on it that obeys the axioms of group theory. We now have this subgroup of H, which is N, which is a normal subgroup in H. So, of course, what we can then do is construct H quotiented out by N. And what will we do to do that? We will partition H up into the cosets of N, okay? And, of course, what cosets will we get? We'll get the exact same cosets as we would have got if we'd viewed H as a, a part of the larger group, capital G. Okay, so when you quotient up this subgroup H into the cosets of n, you'll get the exact same cosets that you would have partitioned it up to, up into, when you were viewing it as just being part of the larger group capital G. So when you quotient a G up into cosets, you actually quotient it up H into cosets as well. And those cosets that you get there are exactly the same as what you would have got if you view H as being a group in its own right with this normal subgroup n, and you now just want to quotient H up into its um, cosets of n. So that's why I know that indeed, yes, H is going to have to contain an exact number of cosets of N here. Okay, it's going to have to be uh, partitioned into these cosets of N, uh, and those are just a subset of the cosets that the entire group will be quotiented up into. Okay, so what we can do then is if we've got this subgroup H, which is a subgroup of G that contains the normal subgroup capital N, the way we can find its corresponding subgroup of the quotient group is we can just partition it up into the cosets uh, of this normal subgroup N, and then what will we end up with? We'll end up with a subset of the cosets that are in the entire quotient group of G by N. And what I now need to prove to you is that indeed that is going to be a subgroup. Okay, so I need to prove that not only is that just a subset of the cosets here, that it is in fact a subgroup. But before I actually go on to that proof, let me just state the other way around, because I don't just want this to be a correspondence this way, I want it to be a bijective correspondence. I want to be able to say that every subgroup here has a corresponding one here, and that every one over here has a corresponding one here. So there's a way of taking a subgroup of the quotient group here, 
okay, and returning to a subgroup of the original group capital G that completely contains the normal subgroup. So you can go both ways, and that's why this is bijective, why uh, they are in bijective correspondence in this way. Everyone here has a corresponding one here, everyone here has a corresponding one here. Okay, the diagram would be beautiful. You'd have a line going from everyone here to one over here, and it would be beautiful. Okay, right, so let's go the other way around now. So if I've got a subgroup of the quotient group, so if I've got H bar, which is a subgroup of the quotient group, how do I then get back to having a subgroup uh, that is in between the normal subgroup and the entire group capital G. Well, the way you construct H from H bar is you take the union of all of the cosets. So H bar is a subgroup of this. So it's going to contain lots of it's going to contain lots of um, cosets. Okay, loads of cosets in the quotient group. Now, those cosets are, of course, subsets of the initial group, capital G. So what you can do is union together all of the cosets. So union together, they are all subsets of G. Union together all of those subsets to create back a larger subset of G. So union together all of the cosets that are in H bar. And, of course, what you will then end up with is a subgroup of capital G. And it's my clay... Sorry you'll end up with a subset of capital G, and it is my claim that what you will end up with is actually a subgroup of capital G. So I hope you understand what I'm saying there. You have lots of cosets in H bar. Those cosets all contain lots of elements of capital G. Just union together all of the cosets to get a huge great subset of capital G, and I claim that that's actually going to be a subset of capital G that contains n. I hope it's obvious that it will contain n, because one of the cosets that h bar will have to contain is the identity coset, because it's a subgroup. Okay, so it will have to contain the entire normal subgroup capital N. So when you do perform this union, you will certainly get all of n. So I hope it's obvious that this is a subset that does contain capital N. What we now need to prove is that indeed it is actually a subgroup of capital G, and then we will have proven that each subgroup here has a corresponding subgroup in between the normal subgroup and G uh, over here. Okay, right. So, let's now prove this correspondence. So, we're going to start going forwards. We're going to start with a subgroup of capital G that contains the normal subgroup capital N, and we're going to prove that when you actually quotient this out by the normal subgroup and get a bunch of cosets of the quotient group of G by N, that that subset of the quotient group of G by N is actually a group, or, or rather is actually a subgroup. Sorry, did I say subgroup? Uh, I should have said that that subset of the quotient group of G by N is actually a subgroup. So we want to prove that this thing that we're constructing, H quotiented out by N, is actually going to be a subgroup of the um, larger quotient group G by N. Okay, so we'll start with this proof then. So this is the proof of the red arrow, so I'll underline it in red here. Okay, so we're going to start with the assumption then that we have some subgroup of G that is in between the normal subgroup and the entire group, capital G. So here is our subgroup H here. Okay, and what we now want to do is construct this subgroup of the um, quotient group. So we're going to construct H quotiented out by N, and of course we'll get lots of cosets. Okay, so we'll certainly get a subset of the quotient group of G by N, as we've discussed already. What we now want to prove is that this subset of the quotient group, this subset of cosets that are in the quotient group, is actually going to be a subgroup. Now, to do that, we need to check that it obeys the axioms of group theory with the composition law that it inherits from the quotient group. Okay, so axiom number one of group theory then. Axiom number one of group theory is closure. So we need to prove that if we take any two cosets, Okay, so we'll have x bar and y bar, which are elements of H quotiented out by N. So these are cosets that are actually in this subset of the quotient group. I need to prove that if I compose these together, so x bar composed with y bar here, and this is composition in the actual quotient group here, because of course we're just restricting the composition law down to this subset here. I need to prove that the element that I get, the answer, is going to be in the uh, subset as well. It's going to be an H quotient out by N, and I am not going to get some answer that's outside of H quotient out by N and in the larger quotient group of G quotient out by N. 
Okay, so how can I prove this? Well, of course, to work this out, to work out what x bar composed of y bar is going to equal, I just use the definition of composition in the quotient group. I take a representative from here, take a representative from here, okay, I will take x and I will compose it with y according to the initial group composition law. So I've chosen um, logical um, representatives from both of my cosets here. I've named this coset after x, I've named this coset after y. Those are logical representatives to take. Okay, you would compose those two together and take the coset that contains it. Now, think about this. If x bar and y bar were cosets in the uh, quotient of h by n, i.e. they were in this subset of the entire quotient group here, then what does that mean about x and y? It means that x and y were in the subgroup capital H, which was a subgroup of capital G. Otherwise, of course, the cosets that they were in would not be in this subset of the quotient group. Okay, uh, looking at this picture here, uh, we have got some cosets here that are in this portion, this pink portion, quotiented up into the cosets of the normal subgroup here. That means that the elements in these cosets were in the uh, subgroup capital H, of course, that's obvious. Okay, so now what we're asking is we want to compose X and Y together in the initial group capital G. Now because H is a subgroup of capital G, we will get some answer that is in capital H. So what I can assure you is that X composed with Y is an element of capital H, okay, because H is a subgroup of capital G. And that means that when you ask what coset is x composed with y going to be in, of course it's going to be in a coset that is in h quotient out by m, because the element here that you're asking about is in h, so of course it's going to end up in a coset in this subset of the quotient group of h uh, quotient out by n. So this is indeed going to end up as an element of h quotient out by n. So that's absolutely fine. There is closure verified. So we now know that if we compose any two cosets in this subset together, that we will end up with another answer in that subset, i.e. we won't end up with something that's in the larger quotient group, but isn't in this subset. So that's excellent. Closure is done. Axiom number two of group theory is associativity. We do not need to worry about associativity. We know associativity works on the larger quotient group, okay? Uh, and we've just got a subset of the quotient group with the inherited composition law on it. Uh, so we know that when whatever subset you take uh, and put the inherited composition law from the larger group, whether it's a subgroup or not, that inherited composition law must obey associativity. Otherwise, um, it wouldn't obey associativity when it was part of the larger composition law on the larger group. Okay, so if this obeys associativity, this cannot uh, possibly not have its inherited composition law obeying associativity. So we really do not need to worry about axiom number two. We do need to check axiom number three. We need to check that the uh, identity element from this larger group is going to be in our subset. Okay, well why is that going to be true? Well, because H completely contained N. So one of the cosets that will be in this quotient of H by N is the coset that contains the identity element. So the identity bar, uh, the coset that contains the identity from the original group, capital G, is going to be in H quotient out by N, and of course this is our identity in the quotient group. Okay, so indeed the identity in the quotient group is going to be in this subset of the quotient group. Okay, and finally, axiom number four, we need to check that inverses are going to be in the quotient group. Okay, so for all uh, cosets x bar here, okay, which are in the uh, quotient of h by n, this subset of the quotient group, I need to check that it's inverse. Okay, it must be the case that there exists another coset which I'll call x bar inverse here, it must also be in this subset h quotient out by n. Now, why can I be sure of that? Well, in the larger quotient group here, what is uh, the inverse of this coset x bar here? Okay, so because I know that the quotient group is indeed a group, I know that this coset x bar, which is, since it's an element of this subset of the quotient group, it is an element of the quotient group, okay, I know that it will have an inverse in the larger group. Now, what is the nature of that inverse? Well, the claim is that this is going to be the coset that contains the inverse of x, okay? Now, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, of course, the initial group capital G has an inverse for x in it, 
and I claim that the coset that contains that inverse for x is going to be the um, inverse in the quotient group for the coset that contains x. Okay, and the reason is that if I compose these two together in the quotient group, I'll just take a representative from here, take a representative from here. I can pick the x representative from here, the x inverse representative from here, compose them together, I'll get the identity in the initial group. So I'll get the identity coset as my overall answer. Okay, so indeed, uh, these two cosets will be one another's inverses uh, in the quotient group. Okay, but of course, this coset is going to be an element of h quotient out by n, and the reason is that x, if, if the coset containing x was in h quotient out by n, then that implied that x was an element of capital H, of course, okay, for the same argument as we had up there. Now, because h is a subgroup, x's inverse must also be an h, okay, so x inverse will also be an element of h, and therefore the coset that contains x inverse will be an element of h quotient out by n. Okay, so indeed, the inverse coset to this one in the uh, quotient group will be in this subset. So this subset does have inverse cosets in there. Okay, so indeed, this is now a subgroup of the quotient group. So h quotient out by n is indeed a subgroup of g quotient out by n. So you can truly find a fairly natural way of taking any subgroup of the group capital G that contains the normal subgroup capital N and taking it to a corresponding subgroup of the quotient group. We'll have a break here and in the next video we'll prove the other way around that if you have a subgroup of the quotient group that there is this very natural way of constructing a subgroup of the initial group that completely contains the normal subgroup.